360 and the training camp update alongside Chad Withrow. I'm Jonathan Hutton. Paul Koharski joins us from Titans training camp, which has just wrapped up the first practice in pads for the Tennessee Titans of 2021. Uh, Paul, who flashed today outside of the starters? You, you mentioned one veteran addition that joined this team last week in John Simon. What have you noticed from him? Uh, he, he's made some plays. He looks like he knows what he's doing in this uh, in this system for sure. And I've noticed him a lot more than I've noticed Wyatt Ray or uh, or Derek Roberson's out now. So uh, any of the other uh, R- Rashad Weaver. So um, you know, at, at this point, he looks like a good addition. The question is, how much you know are you willing to deal with the age and the slowness that comes with age? And we know they've dealt with that at other positions willingly. Uh, you know, Will Compton last mm-hmm. year. So we shall see. Had an interception, I think it was yesterday, where he didn't turn his head back. Uh, it was on Ferkser, I think. Didn't turn his head back, but I think read Ferkser's eyes and hands and took the ball away very smartly. I think Vrabel was bitching potentially about pass interference, but I didn't see it. I, 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 you know, uh, usually if you don't turn your head back, you get in some trouble. It's very quick, bang, bang kind of play from short you know probably from the eight yard line so um i think he's looked pretty good um certainly given you know we've covered time and time again how little they have at that spot um third third edge guy and um you know without dupree here a lot of opportunity there i haven't really noticed anybody have noticed john simon a little bit and as far as rookies go how about Monty Rice, third-round pick? We haven't discussed him much over the first week. Normally, that's a position that can that can show up a bit with the pads popping. Yeah, and he, he laid a couple pops today. Um, I, I, I think he's the kind of guy that they were really waiting to see. Mike, Mike Vrabel pointed to him. I, I think he started to kind of list some guys that they really wanted to see in pads yesterday when we were asking pad preview questions. And uh, I don't think he crafted much of a list, but Monty Rice was one name that came out of his mouth. And uh, he popped a couple today. He's, you know, very clearly, as you would expect, um, to be uh, right there after uh, Evans and, um, and Brown. So we, probably with Long, uh, those are the, the next two inside linebackers. Who's the forgotten offensive tackle right now in the mix? David Quesenberry. We've talked time and time again about what could hold Dylan Radins back at, at uh, offensive tackle. And we've talked about Kendall Lamb could be the opening opening day starter. We kind of set Ty Sambrilo aside because uh, we, we figured Ty Sambrilo would be working his way back. And he came off uh, the injured list on Monday, yesterday, along with, uh, with uh, McNichols and along with Caleb Farley. Caleb Farley being the headliner there. Sam Brilo will certainly be worked back, uh, you know, at a, at a pace like all these other guys. But Quessenberry, you know, played pretty effectively down the stretch as the Titans' third offensive tackle last year. Now, he got shredded while the Titans got shredded against Baltimore. But he played, you know, and he needed help. I'm not saying he was uh, starting caliber left tackle for the Titans last year, but they obviously like how he played the situation given the situation that he was put in and i think collectively we've made a mistake to not mention him when we're talking about what's going on at tackle um so left tackle and right tackle reps are available right now with taylor lawan not playing in team and quesenberry's in that mix um so we we should we should list him so uh paul shane bowen said that jim schwartz has been a, a great sounding board and a great resource so far in camp. <laughs> yeah, what, what's what's your observation been like of Jim Schwartz in terms of his involvement in practice? Well, on the side, very observational. Um, and, uh, you know, I, it's not like I keep a close eye on him, Chad, because I'm watching something else, right? But he uh, – I don't know what to do with that hat there. But he is um, – looks like a guy who's – a you know, special counselor to the defensive coordinator. If, if you ask me to drop in as a guy who's watched a lot of football practices and say, what does that guy do? 
I'd say he's uh, he's kind of a sounding board guy. And uh, I, I know you're desperate for those roles to be flipped, and you'd love to hear that. Uh, you'd love to see Jim Schwartz up there saying, Shane Bowen's a nice guy for me to go to uh, <laughs> for some extra information once in a while. But uh, those roles are not what you wish they were. Well, you know, and also optics matter. Schwartz is doing his talking inside, right? Yes. Like he knows everyone's watching him out there. Vrabel knows everyone's watching Schwartz to see his mannerisms and how much input he's giving to Bowen. It matters that he doesn't vocalize those things in the public exactly. eye, in the media eye. He's doing that behind the scenes. Yeah, he's doing little enough that our eyes uh, are averted to something else. I mean, you check in on Schwartz, you see that he's not really doing anything. Um, and and you look back to find the ball or during the open period where you can shoot shoot pictures or shoot video he's not really doing anything with hands on and and you only have limited time so you've got to get shots of that are more active so um that, you're right uh, i mean his impact is more inside or you know they're out here a second time a day a lot of times that's not open to us that's more uh mm, at a walk yes. through speed um and he may be you know positioning bodies or having conversations with individuals or units during that so we had a we had a caller early on in in the decade-long trio that is this show uh and I, did he call in as the mythical creature cthulhu or was it part of the joke i can't remember <laughs> but uh, in in, es, in essence rashawn evans compared julio jones to cthulhu in a way didn't he <laughs> He did. Uh, he's an <laughs> Alabama guy through and through, Rashawn Evans. And he said that at Alabama, Julio Jones was like a mythical creature. Like, it sounded like, you know, he held in high regard for uh, an outstanding career and for what he was doing in Atlanta. But that when he was around, it was kind of like, you know, ooh, Julio Jones is here, you know, but not like omnipresent or entirely visible kind of a mystical quality to him uh i would think from rashawn evans perspective or from guys that were at bama in that time frame and derrick henry wasn't far off that right that that's pretty cool to have that guy in your locker room all of a sudden a revered uh, and there are guys like that all around the league right but bama makes it extra special the saban connection makes it extra special and then you've got you know julio jones's persona which is He's pretty reserved and in the background guy, not not an out front guy, even even at homecoming at Alabama. So uh, I think those guys are pretty jacked to have him on the team, and uh, and like Titans fans all around, hoping that uh, that little tweak is doesn't amount to much, and and that Chad's worry, which yep. uh, you know is in line with Titans fans all all around, proves ultimately unwarranted. It reminds me almost of the, the first season of True Detective with the Yellow King. I feel like Cthulhu and the Yellow King sort of coincided with our previous show's history, but that's uh, sort of the mythology around Julio Jones. Uh, if only that show hadn't been living up to expectation. by a terrible ending where they sit and look up at the stars and talk about <laughs> the mystical and mysticism. It fit right in for you at the hatch. Paul hated a show that uh, he loved a show that was about mysticism in a mystery the entire season, and then hated it when the show ended on mystery and mysticism, which was consistent with the entire show. The uh, ending was terrible, but I will say at least I got to see it. Unlike you, who was counting on Clay Travis, who butchered the, the oh, yes. DVRing of it. That I, I got that to night. see it, but I got to see it at home uh, by myself <laughs> after the watch party. <laughs> we had a nice dinner party. Uh, it was supposed to be a watch party that turned into just a dinner party. Uh, because, because Clay butchered the recording, and then I got home and watched it. It's great. Um, every day after we get the, the Titans report from PK, uh, we'll try to go into one big Titans topic. Today, let's discuss Josh Reynolds. But but from this angle, Paul, I know you, you did a show last week for fantasy football and sports betting where you're trying to predict um, – where the offense will be, right? They're wanting numbers on A.J. Brown. I, uh, on, on Sunday Night Sports Central for News Channel 5, they asked me my, my prediction for where A.J. Brown will be with Julio Jones. There's a lot of unknowns with this. But 
you know, I, I think for comparison's sake, the Titans were 16 yards away last season from having two 1,000 yards receivers if Corey Davis stepped up and made some big plays over the final three weeks where he really dropped off. My point there is I do think A.J. can get the three-peat with 1,000 yards receiving, and we know he'll become just the seventh wide receiver since 1970 to start a career with three straight seasons of 1,000-plus. That being said, how much does Josh Reynolds factor in to the overall offense? Because the one uncertainty that is that makes it extremely hard to predict is, historically speaking, we have never seen an offense like this Titans group where they have the top running back in the NFL, a 2,000-yard rusher at that, paired with two elite top wide receivers on any offense. We, we have never seen that. And that now is coupled with a third wideout in Josh Reynolds, who is predictably more healthy than what Adam Humphreys provided in the third wideout role a year ago. So in trying to really dive in and say, here's how it's going to be allotted to each player, I, I think that it's, it's impossible to try to pick out a number in that regard. I think it's impossible to uh, it's foolhardy, and we'll leave it for other people to, to play with the numbers. Um, you know, look, I'm also presuming that Josh Reynolds gets healthy and uh, and is out here and dependable on on a weekly basis. Um, I, I think in the end, you know, he he should have numbers on par or better than what he did last year because the Titans are going to spread the ball around and it's going to be a game by game matchup. But I I think all of these guys, Hut are, uh, you know, one week maybe going to have a great game and, and another week. They're not going to be great fantasy football players. I, I mean, Julio Jones and A.J. Brown are going to be great fantasy football players in that in the end you're going to be happy to have had them on your team. But I still think, uh, you know, there's going to be a week where you're going to be cursing A.J. Brown or Julio Jones for having three catches and 40 yards and maybe not sniffing the end zone. Uh, just because the matchup doesn't go that way, the other guy has a big week, or Derrick Henry does most of the offense, and and it's Ferkser who gets the the one passing touchdown or something like that. It's just not a team that's crafted to really distribute, you know, this, this, and this, and it's going to go that way virtually every week. I just don't think it's gonna it's going to run that way very often. I dissuade people from uh, you know who want week to week consistency from looking looking to them. And Josh Reynolds is a, a bit of a mystery right now because we haven't seen him operate at full speed, really. And we don't know much about what's going on. And when I say we don't know much, I mean we don't know anything. Yeah, and, he, you know, he's more of a piece now than he is a big addition. At least that's how I view it because of the, the, the signing and trade for, for Julio. Uh, but the question is how big of a piece to the overall offensive pie is Reynolds when healthy? Because he was really good at moving the chains out west. Like that, that's where he really impacted their offense. Of his 52 catches, 31 went for first downs. It's a very small number to, to try to dive into on third down. He only had 14 catches on third down, but 11 of those 14 catches went for first down. So he's a chain mover. That's impactful to an offense, and that's impactful to a scoreboard. And, and while I agree it's going to be hard to predict week to week how this offense goes, I also don't know how to compare them to other offenses. Are they more like Kansas City? Kansas City, for instance, they have a big two, and then they have role players and, and really three pieces behind their top two receiving options that last year all had 420 yards or more. Is Reynolds going to fall into that category as an extra guy that's a role player that opens it up for the top two? Or is it more like Carolina? Carolina is the other example to point to where the Panthers had a big three. They didn't have a big two. They had a big three. They had two 1,000-yard receivers. They had DJ Moore and Robbie Anderson. And then they also had Curtis Samuel, who had 77 catches for 851 yards. That's a big jump for Josh Reynolds, who had 52 catches last year. So I, I think if you can figure out where Reynolds is in this offense, you have a good idea of distribution within the overall flow and rhythm of this offense. Because... Is he a part of the top three, or is he a part of the group that's after the top two? Yeah, that's a very good question. Is it two and then, or is it three and then? I think some of that, too, depends on 
how sustainable Marcus Johnson, Chester Rogers, and I would put those two now in a tier of their own. And then Nick Westbrook, Akina, and Des Fitzpatrick, I think I'd put in a tier of their own. And then I'd put Racy McMath. Um, so it depends on the sustainability of those guys as well. Depends on injuries. And I know it's a totally different thing, but I'm compelled to mention the Yankees here. You know, you have Aaron Judge and you add Giancarlo Stanton and you think, what could possibly go wrong? You got two huge boppers, you know, and it didn't didn't work out great in part because of injuries. And then you say, hey, how do we fix that? Oh, we go get Joey Gallo, another another huge productive guy, you know. It, it, it's apples to oranges, I know, but uh, sometimes just stacking – great on great doesn't turn out to be uh the answer i I think we all expect it will be here uh certainly with the two guys reynolds uh you know it's not of the same caliber um but they they spent on him expecting him to be a top three contributor for sure and uh it's a long way off like i said 41 43 days something like that but he's given a lot of time to a lot of guys to make good impressions Paul, we saw the debut today of Sam Ficken. I know he was out there yesterday, but the kickers had a day off. Um, What did you notice from the new kicker and overall the kicking game? Perfect day. Uh, They kicked from, uh, I can't remember, 30 30 to 50, uh, maybe six kicks each, and hit every one of them. Nothing really in question. Um, And today... Everything's great in Wonderland uh, in terms of, of hitting field goals. So for a day, not a question. Um, and maybe um, the presence of Ficken brought out the best in uh, Mr. McCann. So we shall see where it goes from here. And we should mention the, the news in the division today, also the news in the division yesterday. Wentz out with Crazy. surgery on his foot yesterday. Um, we, we learned that he's out five to 12 weeks. You can laugh all you want about the timetable. The Titans play the Colts in week three. Also, the Colts announcing today, Quentin Nelson is going to miss time due to foot surgery, similar to that of Carson Wentz. He's now Copycat. out. That, those are massive losses for a team that you know won 11 games and made the postseason last year. Uh, they're now struggling to find remedies to big starters, and and Nelson is right up there with the top guards in the NFL. Titans once lost to Curtis Painter, right? So a Titans fan shouldn't chalk up wins against the Colts, but it's certainly a bad time for the Colts right now and something you wouldn't want your team to be suffering. So uh, bad news. Uh, You know, your best player and your quarterback down. And that's an awfully big timetable. If they're both pushing the far end of that, you're talking about half of a season. And uh, I know that I think they start with two NFC teams, but then I think with the Titans there, they've got the Ravens and the Dolphins playoff contending teams. Um, It's going to be a tough go. Yeah, they open the season against Seattle. Uh, They then have the Rams. They play the Titans, and then Paul's right. Then, then they continue that slug through the, the AFC where they face the Dolphins, the Ravens, and the Texans uh, before they get to the end of October. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a tough stretch. Brutal, brutal, brutal. Tough, tough stretch whenever you consider what they're lacking up front now in the offensive line and the remedy that they're trying to figure out at, at quarterback, whether that guy's currently on the roster or not. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and hit the bell so you're notified every time OutKick 360 goes live. We are live weekdays, 11 a.m. Central, noon Eastern, right here across the OutKick network. And while you're at it, like this video and let us know what you think in the comments below.